60 minutes, maybe a little less, and then we'll open the forum to questions. Uh, for those who are live streaming, please use the chat feature, uh, the chat feature, and uh, that'll work for you. And those will be displayed up here. And for our audience, please use these mics that are positioned at the bottom of the aisles. And our ground rules are, please tell us who you are, and please ask a question. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to... Uh, Dr. Simons and Craig, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. I appreciate that very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation to be here. Uh, I'm glad to be moderating this panel. Like you, I know most of these guys. Um, I also want to thank you and the Institute for all that you do to promote and sustain interest and understanding in the history of the United States Navy uh, problems today and the way the Navy has handled circumstances in the past, which is what we're going to talk about a little bit today, and that is leadership and decision-making in the Pacific theater. Now, let me introduce the panel, uh, uh, who are all actual friends of mine. I'll start at the other end, alphabetically, with Tom Cutler. Uh, hardly needs an introduction to this audience, I suspect. <laughs> Most of you know him or know of him. Uh, there's many books and articles in Proceedings in Naval History magazines. Uh, I first met Tom 35 years ago. I looked it up, Tom. Uh, he was teaching over in the Seamanship and Navigation Department at the Naval Academy and came over to teach naval history to plebes because he loved naval history so much. And his love for that subject was so palpable, he was tremendously successful in the classroom. The mids loved him. Tom then became my associate chair when I was chairman of the department, and we have been friends ever since. He's currently the Gordon England Chair of Professional Literature at the Institute, and I understand recently endowed with a new title as the Institute's Naval Historian. Among his many other projects, he's currently working on a biography of Ernest Evans, the hero of, or I should say one of the heroes of, the Battle of Samar during uh, the Battle of Leyte Gulf, and I'm looking forward to hearing about that. Um, Again, proceeding alphabetically, to my right, Trent Hone, another well-known authority on the history of the U.S. Navy, especially the 20th century U.S. Navy, 21st century U.S. Navy as well. His byline has appeared in dozens of institute publications, as well as several books, including his newest, which I'm going to hold up here, Mastering the Art of Command, which focuses particularly on Chester Nimitz, who will be a subject of our conversation today. Uh, Trent brings particular insight to that consideration because in addition to being an authority on all things naval, he's also an expert in the field of broader leadership principles and organizational structures. Paul Stilwell, in the middle of our group down here, is another old friend. We used to play softball together some 30 years ago. I think our softball days are behind us now, Paul, yes. I'm afraid. Um, in addition to Paul's tenure uh, when he was uh, editor of Naval History Magazine, I'm convinced the entire community of naval historians, and certainly including me, uh, will be indebted to him uh, for his leadership of the oral history program, which has saved from obscurity the memories of many Navy veterans. Also a prolific author in his own right, uh, and has written a number of valuable books, the most recent of which, just out, is... Another show and tell, Battleship Commander, which is a life and study of Vice Admiral Willis Lee. More about him soon enough. The Institute has given us a big topic today. Uh, the Pacific is by far, was by far, the largest command theater in the Second World War. Uh, a piece of information that I have to say out loud because I always find it almost destabilizing is that if you take all of the land mass of the planet, all of the continents and all of the islands and all, of, all land on planet Earth, it would fit inside the Pacific Ocean with 5 million square miles to spare. So we're talking about a big area here. And one of the problems with that, of course, is managing so large a theater, uh, not only in terms of command decision making, but also and maybe particularly in terms of logistics. So I want to start at the top of that command pyramid, if I may, with Chester Nimitz, which means, Trent, I'm going to give you the first question here. Um, but I want to emphasize that I'm hoping this will be a discussion, 
not just a question and an answer routine. So if anybody wants to jump in anywhere along the line and add their views, please do. Trent, I hope you'll tell us a little bit about how Nimitz got this job to begin with. Uh, we know now with the benefit of hindsight that it was a brilliant decision, um, but not everyone thought so at the time. How did it come about? Nimitz had actually been offered the office before, uh, which I think is quite interesting. And, you know, before the attack on Pearl Harbor, before the United States enters World War II, he's offered you know, the commander-in-chief role, and he turns it down. And I think that was an astute decision on his part because for him to achieve that, that position, uh, he would have leapfrogged a great number of other officers that uh, were advanced of him in terms of their career and their standing. And, and he didn't want to create a dynamic that would make it more difficult for him to work with them. He's very sensitive to this ability to uh, collaborate effectively with other naval officers. And uh, so he wanted to be able to, uh, uh, to obtain the role, succeed in the role, but succeed not as an individual, uh, but as a, a core member, a leader of an effective team. And a lot of the work that he does after he assumes that responsibility is building that team, forming that team, making it yeah. cohesive and acting together. Uh, but it's, I, I do think there is an interesting anecdote in the aftermath, in the, the very near-term aftermath of, of Pearl Harbor. Navy Secretary Frank Knox goes to Pearl Harbor, examines the devastation for himself, is convinced uh, that Admiral Husband Kimmel, the current uh, commander-in-chief of the fleet, will need to be relieved, replaced. Uh, and it, it, so they, he and President Roosevelt start discussing, well, who's, who's the best suited uh, you know, for, for this, for this mm. opportunity? And Nimitz had been the, the next one up, sort of the second on the, on, on the, on the list mm. uh, prior to Kimmel achieving it. And FDR is like, yeah, I'm happy with that. You know, well, that next FDR one. knew Nimitz because Nimitz had been chief of the Bureau of Navigation, which we, is now the Bureau of Personnel. So they, he knew him. He, I mean, they, he was a known quantity. Of course, Roosevelt took great pride in knowing all admirals. Yes, that, that was a thing with him. So, so this was a known quantity for FDR. Well, absolutely. I think that is a key part of the, of, of the choice as yeah. well. So FDR not only knows him, yeah. right? He's been there in Washington, head of the Bureau of Navigation, Bureau of Personnel. Right. Uh, but it, it, FDR also has a sense for Nimitz's ability to understand the capabilities of naval officers, particularly more senior naval officers. It's yeah. a community that isn't very large, and Roosevelt has confidence that Nimitz is going to be able to figure out how to okay. get the most out of these right. officers, how to yeah. organize them. Yeah. Not everybody had that kind of confidence. King wasn't so sure he's the guy. No, King has a different perspective. I think if we look at Roosevelt, he has a sense of this, the importance of interpersonal relationships. Yeah. Like everyone who comes close to Roosevelt yeah. has some comment about his ability to either act Politically, if they want to be a little, uh, mm. introduce a little dig, or diplomatically, if they want to be more mm. complimentary. Uh, mm. uh, King is much more, how do we get this job done? And this job is warfare. Yeah. And King is not certain Nimitz is best suited to do that. He thinks, yeah. well, Nimitz may be more of a, of a paper pusher, an administrator, someone yeah. who can, you know, smooth over these yeah. relationships. They, they call him a fixer. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It, Whatever it was, that means. I'm which sure. did not, which was not a compliment. No, no, in, not in, in the context of the time. Um, and yeah, no, King is not so. Sold. So Nimitz finds himself in this position with a commander in chief who apparently has his back, but a boss who maybe not so sure. How did he survive this? He tells his wife in this letter, I'm not sure I'm going to survive six <laughs> months. Yeah. But he does. So what's the secret to that? He, he, he does. There's, there's a few key things that I think he, uh, that he does that uh, allow King to begin to gain confidence. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll list a few of them. One of them is uh, he acts aggressively very early on, uh, finds a way to reinvigorate the morale of the fleet by uh, beginning to attack Japanese positions. So there's mm -hmm. the raid mm -hmm. that Admiral Halsey leads mm -hmm. uh, into the Marshall Islands, uh, Admiral Fletcher is part of that as well, on uh, the 1st of February. Yeah. And this displays that not only can the Pacific Fleet fight back, uh, but also, within a couple of weeks, begins to reveal intelligence that this is having an influence on Japanese decision-making. Okay. This intelligence arises through, through code-breaking, cryptography, signals intelligence, and the like. King's 
still pressuring Nimitz. Yeah. Uh, and so King, uh, Nimitz takes the officer who had been the interim fleet commander between his tenure and Kimmel's, uh, Vice Admiral William S. Pye. Pye and King have had a longstanding relationship. Yeah. And Nimitz sends Pye to Washington, explain the situation. As Good we can choice, see it. by the way, to send Pai. That's it's an clever. excellent choice. Yes, it's an excellent choice because Pai has been part of these command conversations. He knows what's going on within the Pacific Fleet's headquarters, and he's a friend of King's. So let me ask you this question. We, we have this impression, I have this impression, of Nimitz as somebody who gets along, who gets well. He's calm, he's benign, and all this, but he's also <laughs> clever. I mean, and, and sending Pai is an example of that cleverness. His ability to stand up to King without pissing King off. Mm -hmm. which is frankly pretty easy to do, <laughs> uh, suggests that there are depths here that beyond that, that calm, placid exterior. Oh, absolutely. Yes. I, I think there are valuable clues in Nimitz's uh, 1923 Naval War College thesis as a tactical thesis. And, and the thing that uh, it recurs through it is this idea of to, to command successfully, uh, you, you, have to be, you have to be aggressive. You have to, uh, this, this concept of calculated risk, which we yeah. associate so often with Midway, the, the, the precursors of that are in yeah. that thesis. Yeah. Uh, and so you can see that in the decision to attack in the Marshall Islands with Halsey. Uh, you can see that later on in the plans for Midway and Coral Sea. Yeah. And so there's this edge that Nimitz has that is underneath the yeah, sort of the classic classic exterior. Yeah. Although his aide, Hal Lamar, and, and the, the doctor, whose last name I can't pronounce, Jin Tro or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, noticed that at some point his hand begins to tremble. So maybe, despite the calmness that we see, there's some tension in there. And the way he wants to solve that problem, or, or at least address that question, is they erect a pistol range, a shooting range, outside his office. Because that forces the shooter, Paul, you know where I'm going with this, right? That forces the shooter to concentrate, to steady his nerves in order to take advantage of that. And so I'm shifting now to Willis Lee. Because Willis Lee, for those who don't know, was a crack shot, won a pocket full of medals at the Olympics. Um, seven? I mean, however many? Eight, what? Eight, yeah. eight Olympic medals for both pistol and rifle. Does that give us a window into Willis Lee? Was he so calm that he could win eight gold medals? And did that allow him to be successful in command? Exactly so. And before getting to Admiral Lee, I'd like to add a footnote because authors do use footnotes. In, in those uh, softball games 30-some years ago, Tom was involved also. And we are retired now. In 2011, I had a hip replacement, and the medical people said, whatever you do, don't run unless it's absolutely necessary to save your life. And I said, thank you very much. I haven't run since. <laughs> <laughs> I want to add one thing on the code breaking. Joe Roachford gets a great deal of credit for running Station Hypo in the basement at Pearl Harbor, led to the... Coral Sea, Midway, Guadalcanal, and so forth. He was a Japanese language student, and he had a rare gift of being able to fill in the blanks that the code breakers themselves could not. And the best, the, the code breaker who was really getting the parts that could be gotten was Tommy Dyer. And I interviewed him not long before he died, and he had a, a Colonel Sanders look-alike, and he had a perpetual twinkle in his eye. And I asked him, what was the sensation for being able to look through and read those Japanese messages that they didn't want us to read? And he said, well, the physical sensation was not the same, but it was as satisfying as sex. So imagine that. I asked him... Where would you rank yourself with no false modesty among the code breakers, the pure code breakers? He said, I was the best. Well, there's no false modesty there. A person who did have a great deal of modesty was Willis Lee, graduated from the Naval Academy in 1908. He had grown up in Kentucky, and I talked to people back in Kentucky who knew him when he was young, and they said, 
seem to have an unlimited uh, amount of enthusiasm for shooting at things and unlimited amount of ammunition. So weather vanes, wildlife, uh, somebody's up to the stairs window. He came to the academy in 1904. In 1907, the National Rifle and Pistol Championships were held at Camp Perry on the shore of Lake Erie. And uh, the morning of the event, by a, a single point, he won the rifle championship. The afternoon, as he confessed later to a, a classmate, Thomas Kincaid, I uh, decided to might as well do something else, so then he won the pistol championship, the only person to do that. And ironically, he did this even though his vision was so defective that he could not see well at all without glasses, didn't recognize his roommate from across the street. Yeah. He cheated with the help of his classmates. He would always fail the eye test. And then uh, he would ask his classmates, well, what chart are they using today? Because he had memorized all the charts and he'd just read off the letters. <laughs> so there was a bit of guile in him and he took that to the Olympics, 1920 in Antwerp. Uh, five golds or six golds of bronze, <coughs> silver and bronze. And there's a picture in my book. It shows in the Secretary of Navy's office, Josephus Daniels, and there beaming in the middle is Daniels. And on one side is Carl Osborne with his one medal and Willis Lee with his eight. He translated that into what he did in shipboard gunnery, in destroyers, in cruisers. And coming up to World War II, he was very concerned about big gun gunfire with the battleships, the cruisers, and aircraft, because Japanese posed a formidable air arm as it demonstrated at Pearl Harbor. So he worked on radar fire control, both of the big guns and the five inch, 40 millimeter, 20 millimeter. And he had that cool sang frog going into the Battle of Guadalcanal in November 1942. And Trent and I have talked about this. There was a tremendous battle on the 13th of November around Guadalcanal. Admiral Halsey was trying to stop the Tokyo Express from coming down and reinforcing the island with soldiers, supplies, food, ammunition. So it was imperative to stop this force, which included the battleship Kirishima. Lee had the Washington as his flagship, the South Dakota, four destroyers. The destroyers unwittingly became the sacrificial lambs. They led a column in narrow waters where battleships were never intended to fight. The destroyers got taken out by gunfire by torpedoes and burst into flames. Only one of the four survived. But these flagship, as they approached the destroyers, steamed to port. Between the burning destroyers between them and the Japanese, South Dakota had a, a power failure, lost the bubble for a little while, went to starboard, and... She was silhouetted by the burning ships, and her superstructure was riddled. She just took a lot of damage. Lee's force pummeled the Japanese, sank the destroyer Ayanami, and uh, sank the Kirishima. That was the second battleship the Japanese had lost at the beginning of the war in two days. And Samuel Elliott Morrison proclaimed that the victory that night 14th and 15th of November was the turning point in the road when the offense was starting to go toward Tokyo instead of being on the defensive. It was Lee's coolness, his ability to use radar as a weapon. And the Let me follow up on that, that just a bit because it, it struck me uh, in reading about this in, in your fine book that someone who was so skilled at using uh, hand weapons, pistols, rifles, um, had, had a gift that would lead them to think, 
ah, making judgments by the seat of the pants is where I am. And yet he is among the first to embrace and use effectively radar-controlled gunfire at a time when, quite frankly, others were a little suspicious of it. This newfangled thing, I'm not sure this will work. This is not the way I was trained at gunnery school and so on. But he embraces that. Now, how? What? why? He was not only embraced it, but he was an ardent proponent for yes. it. Because he had a mathematical mind, uh, his roommate at the Naval Academy said that the only things that seemed to interest him were shooting and drawing sketches. He could pass the <clears throat> test without studying. He could do trig problems in his head that helped in ship handling. But he saw the <coughs> value more than his contemporaries of being able to combine the gunnery ballistics and the fire control. And in his action report, he said, the Japanese are well-trained. Big difference really was that we had radar and they didn't. Yeah. And he also was a strong proponent of the proximity fuse for any aircraft guns, the five inches. Right. Right. It used to be that you had to lead the target as you would uh, in a duck blind, shooting to where you expected the duck to be. Well, this would automatically compute that lead angle, and you didn't have to actually hit the Japanese aircraft. There was a little radio transmitter that would hit the Japanese plane, send back a signal, that would explode the shell. And his being a proponent of that uh, led to much wider adoption of those projectiles. Yeah, yeah. I, right. I have to inject a little bit because you use radar. I forget exactly what you said, but radar uh, control yeah, it's not control. It's not so controlled. I mean, the, the one Lee does this well because he understands the mathematics, the principles behind it. He understands how radar works, and it, so control is not exactly what Washington does. If you read the details of the action report, her her uh, gunnery group. It's radar ranges. So radar is very accurate for ranges, but they're using visual bearings. So they get a bead on the Japanese battleship. They know where it is. They know how to line the guns up. And if you contrast that with South Dakota's behavior, I mean, certainly South Dakota steams a, a, a way which unfortunately exposes her to the Japanese gunfire when many control systems are down because of the power outage. But her crew focuses more on radar ranges and bearings shoot less accurately as a result. But you see, this is a classic so, example of why this generation that finds itself at the beginning of the war, most only the major combatants had any kind of radar at all, and radar becomes more and more sophisticated as time goes on, and the people who are in command positions by the middle of the war, by, in this case, November of 1942, and certainly by 1943, are beginning to figure it out. But it takes them a while to get this stuff. It does. It does. Yeah. And, and you've got to have you've got to have these detailed knowledge, exactly. all right? It can't just exactly. be radar. So Lee was thing. the right guy in the right place for that battle. And, and of course, the other time, many one of many other times that Lee is prominent in this war is during the Battle of Leyte Gulf. Here's my next segue that allows me to hold <laughs> this book, right, which is edited by Tom Culler. One of two books Tom has done on the Battle of Leyte Gulf, and I want to talk about the Battle of Leyte Gulf a little bit. Um, Tom, as I mentioned, is writing a book about Ernest Evans, who was on the receiving end of the Japanese attack in the Battle of Samar, and uh, the product of Halsey's decision to abandon the San Bernardino Strait. I'm sure we're going to hear more about this, but I want to hear Tom's take on this question. If Evans and his peers in those other small ships did literally save the day, um, what does, is that because of him, or does he represent a generation of naval officers who were simply doing what they knew was expected of them at the time? Was he a hero, or was he a naval officer? <laughs> Excellent question. Um, <clears throat> well, the thing about um, – well, let, let me just make one quick footnote, footnote if I may. Um, you're right. I've written two books about – or done two books about uh, Leyte Gulf. The first was for the 50th anniversary of the battle, and then the second was for the 75th anniversary. But I decided not to wait for the 100th anniversary, and that's why I'm working on this third book about this. <laughs> <laughs> At any rate. <clears throat> um, but, yeah, Ernest Evans is an interesting person. You know, listening, well, first of all, listening to all these 
names being dropped here, all, all these different names that we've heard just in a few minutes in the Pacific War. And you begin to form certain conclusions. And one of them, and also the fact we're talking about leadership here. Well, we're, we are always getting leadership manuscripts here at the Naval Institute Press. I've got the secret sauce to leadership. And, and I mean, they, they just are constantly coming. And people are always looking for that, that secret recipe. What is leadership? What makes good leadership? And of course, there are principles you can draw from that and universal thoughts and that sort of thing. But the bottom line is, look at these people we're talking about here and their leadership styles. Between King and Nimitz, already pointed out, very different. and Lee and so forth. I think that really says a lot about what leadership is. It's, it's a very individual, personal kind of thing, and how people play their own talents to, to use that, some better than others, obviously. So I think that that's, that's one thing you can, you can draw from that. But Ernest Evans is, is uh, kind of an enigma in many ways. We don't know as, as much. I wish we knew more about him because writing a biography about him is a challenge for that reason. There's a lot of empty space there. But one thing we can conclude is that this guy was definitely aggressive. He, um, from his earliest days, he showed signs of aggression. Back when aviation was not uh, uh, viewed as the, the gun club, when he was coming out of the Naval Academy, aviation was, was kind of like, well, why would you want to do that? Well, the one thing it was was dangerous, and it was daring and that sort of thing, and that appealed to him. So he applied for, for flight school. He flunked out. Um, and. Uh, uh, um, it often is. That's the only reason. I yeah, ask. I think it was. Um, so anyway, yeah, he 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 didn't make it through flight school. Pretty early on, he dropped. He was uh, sent sent back to the surface fleet. Now, see if he cheated like Willis Lee on the I exam, he would have been an idiot. <laughs> History would have been different. That's right. That's right. But I think we could say it might be fortunate that he didn't because uh, he he served the surface navy well. Oh, what you have to understand about him is he was he saw his first combat back in the Battle of Java Sea, which is very early in, in, in World War II. And this, this uh, agglomeration of, of uh, British, Australian, um, um, Dutch, and American ships are all put together. What they have are consolidated into this. They, they call it the ABDA force, using the, the first initials. And they, they are trying to stop the Japanese from taking over the uh, Dutch East Indies. <clears throat> and by this time, it's, it comes down to Java. And the Japanese are coming towards Java, and the, the battle that ensues with that ensues uh, winds up to be a defeat. Um, they, they, there's a lot of courage exhibited there, but not a whole lot of skill. They, they've got a lot of problems, communication problems. They don't speak the same languages. Yeah. They don't speak the same languages, and they don't have common doctrine. All these sorts of things. So um, it turns out to be a, a significant defeat, but. Uh, the one thing that comes out of that is that Ernest Evans is there on a destroyer as the executive officer of USS Alden, which is an old Clemson-class destroyer that uh, was obsolete almost when she was built. And by this time, World War II, she's really obsolete. But there are four of these uh, ships, and they, they do make a charge at the Japanese, which uh, gives time for the other ships of ABDA, which are now pretty well beat up, to, to turn away and, and escape to... They fight another day, but they ultimately get sunk. But that's that's after note. But at any rate, but for the moment, they play an important role by running a torpedo torpedo run, and um, so this is a, kind of a precursor to what Evans yeah. is going to be doing later on, and in, in, uh, much later in the war. But the one thing that really bothered him about that, and not him alone, there were others who felt the same way that. They, many of them felt they were conflicted about. It. They were relieved that they did. They, they escaped. They were the only four, by the way. All the rest of the ships, the Dutch, the Australians, the British, all were sunk. But the four American destroyers managed to escape. Relieved at that, of course, but at the same time, um, not uh, feeling, well, we ran in, in that kind of thing. Understandably, but at the same time. Am I that, wrong in thinking that they used up all their torpedoes? Yes, and yes. They were told, well, you're out of ammo. Absolutely. Please. They were absolutely so, out, of, yeah. out of torpedoes, and their guns were only 4.1-inch guns that were... Right ridiculously under under caliber for the the challenge and so forth so so they had to uh, they were told to leave and they did and they got away but they were troubled by this but Evans in particular and so that at the commissioning of he, he later finally gets to get back in the war for the next couple of years he's trailing around he gets command of Alden and takes her to the Caribbean and and uh, to a couple shipyard periods and so forth and he's sitting there he's kind of like um, 
you've seen the movie or the, read the book, Mr. Roberts, this, this terrible frustration of not being in the war, being at the front. And, and Evans, this aggressive personality, is stuck in that limbo, this purgatory. And uh, so finally, he uh, gets command of a Fletcher-class destroyer. And these are the, the, the best destroyers ever made, and uh, many people will, will argue that. He gets command of one of these. But at the commissioning of it, he stands there on, at the commissioning ceremony, and he says, I ran from the Japanese once. I will never do it again. And then he tells his crew, if any of you are not with that, basically there's the door, you know, go. Um, but we're, we're going after the Japanese. Makes it pretty clear. So, and of course, he follows through on that, and that's the big story of, of Leyte Gulf, uh, or the, the charge. Well, tomorrow. part of that story is Ziggy Sprague, too, because Sprague tells him, here come four <laughs> battleships. Take your little destroyers and destroyer escorts and go. Yeah, yeah. And Nobody says boo. They all do it immediately. But right, yeah, you're right. I mean, it I, takes I didn't answer your Sprague to give that order as well. Yeah, I didn't answer your question. In that, yeah, they're all naval officers, and and the John, uh, Evans with the Johnson is not the only one who who uh, charges at the Japanese. They all do. The, the, the destroyers, destroyer escorts, they're all doing going on this incredible suicide charge. Um, we don't want to tell too much about it because we want to buy the next book. But <laughs> anyway. Um, but, but seriously, it, it's, uh, it's an incredible story. Most of you probably are, are quite aware of that. But, uh, but I do think there's a certain element of, of, of course, we're going to do that. The thing that's interesting to me about naval warfare that's different from land warfare, and there are a lot of differences, but one of them is the fact that, that the captain is the one who, it, it's his courage that represents the rest of the crew. You can be the starboard butter cutter on the ship, but you're going to attack the Japanese along with the captain, whether you like it or not. And that's kind of an interesting dynamic, I think, that, that uh, uh, and, and in, in writing this book, I'm trying to get across things like that, to try to put things at the tactical level and also looking at how the crew would view things. I served in a destroyer that was not a Fletcher, but she was the next class after that, very similar in some ways. So I have some, I didn't serve in combat in that ship, but, but I uh, served in that ship. So I have some understanding of what it was like to be an enlisted man on a, on a ship like that. And I'm trying to bring some of that vision in, into the, of what's, yeah. what's going on yeah. there and so forth. So anyway, so that's, that's one thing I'm trying to do. Well, the reason that uh, Evans and Sprague, for that matter, is on the receiving end of this charge by Japanese heavies is because they came through San Bernardino Strait. And there was nothing at San Bernardino Strait to stop them. Um, now, Paul, in, in your book, you talk about this. Lee, of course, is the commander of this nascent Surface Force, Task Force 34, was organized, but the execute order hadn't gone out yet, so there was con confusion about where it was. And everybody knows the famous query that came from Pearl Harbor, where is Task Force 34? But the question I wanted to ask you was that you make it very clear that Lee, uh, particularly the testimony of his flight lieutenant, Gil Erickson, how do you pronounce yes. his last name? Er Gil Erickson. Um, that Lee was pissed off that Halsey was doing, that Halsey was going after the bait carriers. He was leaving San Bernardino Street unguarded, and Lee was not on board with that, and he sent first a, a, a flash message and then a voice message. And I guess my question to you is, did he try hard enough to convince Halsey? He tried as much as he thought he could, and, and Mitcher had essentially the same reaction. I was going to ask you about Mitcher next. <laughs> the, 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 the boss has more knowledge of this. He was not an assertive person, and he figured there was only so much he could do. Uh, he twice alerted the flagship to the independence planes, sighting reports that Corita and his force were heading east toward San Bernardino Strait. And all he got back from the flagship New Jersey was Roger. Uh, Evan Thomas wrote a book about the Battle of Leyte Gulf and had a fascinating, illuminating story that Halsey was already in bed and asleep by the time those messages came. So Halsey was not in on the information on which he might have made a decision to left, leave Task Force 34 behind. And uh, so that could be the failure of the staff. They, they knew that Halsey wanted to go after Ozawa's carriers, but they weren't going to wake the old man. And, and he was nettled this when he got... This is a component of leadership, too. Not just the decision-maker at the top, but the 
the group you you establish around you. We exactly. haven't talked about Douglas MacArthur, which we can do, but I mean, he famously had a staff of yes men and sycophants around him. If Halsey's asleep, what's the responsibility of that staff? Wake him up, get him up, give him this information. Doesn't happen. Well, the he became irritated when he got the where is Task Force 34, the World Wonders. And uh, a retired naval aviator told me a story. There's, there's no corroboration that, that Halsey had not learned about the sighting reports. And when he got the message, that's the reason he was so angry, not because he was being nettled by Nimitz. You buy it? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Well, I, I, I was, I was going to say that. It, so, so I have, you know, to disclose, I have a piece in here. Yes, each of and, you has a piece in here. Yes, Paul that. does as well, and and mine is about Halsey's right. decision making, like you, what ha what happens, and I, I think it's, it's, you know, the staff. I think a lot of the problem is with the staff, but I don't. That doesn't mean it's not Halsey's fault. He's responsible for the organization of his staff and how it operates and what information it brings to him and whether or not it wakes him up. Uh, because new information emerges. And one of the things that I found interesting, I don't think I had seen it by the time I wrote this, but certainly by the time I had written the Nimitz the book, book, is yeah. um, Nimitz and King, and they have conferences throughout the war, uh, and they come together and talk about various things. Uh, a lot of it is about personnel. King is leveraging Nimitz's familiarity with the, the, the Naval, Navy's officer corps. One of the things to talk about is Halsey's staff, yeah. and it's inadequate, and they know it's inadequate. And it, they were talking about, well, what do we do about it? Hadn't done enough, arguably, about it at the time of Liddy Golf yeah. because this happens. Yeah. And, and to some extent, what Halsey decides to do is a, a mess or a challenge of Nimitz's own making because he is dissatisfied with the results of Philippine Sea. Other members of his staff are as well, and they are exerting an influence. Uh, but he had hoped... The, the victory at Philippine Sea would be more dramatic in terms of Japanese ships sunk. To free the ability of the Pacific Fleet and its amphibious forces to operate and accelerate the offensive against Japan. Uh, and so, so, by the way, just let me jump in. For those mm -hmm. who may be listening out there in the virtual world who are unaware, three months prior to the Battle of Leyte Gulf, where Halsey famously left San Bernardino Strait unguarded, allowing the Japanese battleships a battle in the Philippine Sea conducted by Spruance. And, of course, Halsey and Spruance took turns to command of the big blue fleet. Spruance had made the opposite decision. He ordered Mitcher to in 200 miles of the beachhead, make sure that's covered, that's job one, before he could go off to chase after the Japanese carriers. And Halsey believed that was a mistake, and many aviators did as well. So that's the background to this decision. Yes, Halsey thinks that's a, a mistake, but also he gets orders that essentially say, if I can paraphrase it right, if, if an opportunity arises to you know, win a decisive action over the Japanese fleet, take it, right. seize it. Uh, so those are instructions that Spruance didn't get. Yeah. Mitz has altered his instructions, and, and that just builds off of the, dis, the aggressive disposition that Halsey has, because like Evans, he's an old destroyer hand and likes to go charging into into battle, yeah. and he does. Yeah. There's a story that Chester Nimitz Jr. tells, post-war oral history, oral history, uh, where he's having dinner with his father, and they're discussing this circumstance, of what we're holding, and the son asks his father, asks Admiral Nimitz, what order did you give him? And he, the father confesses, acknowledges, <laughs> that he said if an opportunity arises to destroy a major portion of the Japanese fleet, that will become your primary mission. And the son looked at his father and said, well, then it's your fault. <laughs> <laughs> and the response, according to the oral history, is his father said, well, that's your opinion. <laughs> I don't know what, <laughs> what tone of voice he said that. Right. So, and we don't know. But, but uh, yeah, we'll revisit this. Well, Tom, you I want think to jump in on yeah, this? The, just a quick thing. Uh, you mentioned that the uh, that phrase in, comes in about if the opportunity arises so forth. I, I compared operation orders from... Philippine Sea to the Leyte Gulf, and that phrase is inserted mm -hmm. where there was standard phraseology for most of the operations that are coming up. You see this one phrase suddenly inserted, 
because of what happened at Philippine Sea, which yeah. is kind of interesting. Yeah. If you look at it, it doesn't even quite fit. Somebody has not it's quite It's an insert. Fit. You can <laughs> tell it's an insert. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Right. An insert. Well, one of the speculations about this, if Task Force 34 had been left to guard San Bernardino Strait, or if it had turned around even three or four hours sooner, it might have led to a confrontation between Curita's heavy battleships and heavy cruisers and Task Force 34. Well, here's the speculation. <laughs> Paul, who wins that? Well, of course, the U.S. ships, battleships. <laughs> Lee, Lee was sent out in uh, September of 1942 to command the fast battleships. In fact, all battleships in the Pacific Fleet for a while. And stayed there till the spring of 45. And his mission was to be ready to fight the Japanese heavy ships should the opportunity arise. Well, the opportunity was forced upon him at Guadalcanal. In June, at the Marianas, Charlie Burke, who was Mitcher's chief of staff and a very aggressive surface officer, got Mitcher to send a message and say, Lee, take your battleships and go get the Japanese. And Lee sent back a message, do not repeat, do not wish to engage the Japanese. My ships have been in the carrier screens. They've not had an operation to opportunity to operate together, but we're not ready. Some have suggested that as a, a cowardice on Lee's part, but Lee was not a coward. But they had not trained, and his flag lieutenant, Ertzen, said he talked about this later with Lee, and Lee said the tactical situations were completely different and the Marianas, the Japanese, were steaming away from us, didn't con constitute a threat. In the Philippines, they were coming toward us. We could have capped their tea at San Bernardino Strait. And his radar officer said that they could shoot over the horizon and hit the Japanese ships before the Japanese could bring their optical range finders into play. Well, there's, a, there's an important caveat to that message from Lee's at the Philippine Sea. It's about a night engagement. Is one yeah. night engagement, uh, which is you know it, it creates greater variability and uncertainty, um, regardless of, of capabilities. And but he's Santa still Bernardino still been a daytime engagement. Daytime, yeah. mm -hmm. right? I, I suspect you are correct in yeah. all of that. And yes, the two Japanese super battleships had eighteen point one inch guns, but you got to be able to hit something with them. And one of them's <laughs> gone. One of them's already sunk. No, one of them's already there. <laughs> She's already sunk. All right, um, it is now uh, 3.45, and I want to give uh, people an opportunity to ask questions. There are a couple of folks we haven't discussed yet. I'm going to throw this out uh, to the panel about who else we probably ought to mention here, but I want you to begin thinking about what questions you might have both here and out in the virtual world, and I guess the questions will appear on the screen here uh, while we discuss this last question. And my last question to all three of you is, well, we've talked about the subjects of, of your books, Nimitz, Lee, and, and the people who worked around them, for them, and over them. But who have we not mentioned uh, in this? And I will confess that Paul sent me an email a couple of days ago saying, why haven't you put Charlie Lockwood in this? Charlie Lockwood deserves a conversation. How come, Paul? The submarines contributed a, a great deal uh, to the winning of the war in the Pacific. There was a, a previous commander of the submarines in the Pacific, uh, Robert English, who died in a plane crash, and that brought Lockwood, then a rear admiral, forward from Australia to Hawaii. The submarines performed poorly during the first part of the war, in part because of a lack of aggressiveness on uh, pre-war skippers who were coming in, and partly because the torpedoes were faulty. Uh, Lockwood weeded out the good skippers, uh, the, he weeded out the bad one, kept the good skippers, and he did pragmatic tests to see what was happening with the torpedoes and demonstrated that the exploders were not working. Even if they'd hit the ship, no explosion, just a dud. And so that's a poor payoff for a skipper who takes his submarine in within a couple thousand yards and launches and then the Japanese know he's there because they felt the thud. So he got that fixed. And 
there were so many great skippers, very aggressive. These were the underwater counterparts of Ernest Evans, one in particular whom I came to know and admire was Slade Cutter. Four Navy crosses and two silver stars, 19 and a half Japanese ships credited for. And from a strategic sense, this was a great contribution depriving the Japanese of the raw materials coming up from Southeast Asia. And practically, they made contributions as well, including scouting and uh, sinking of Korea's flagship, the Otago, at Leyte Gulf. I agree. I think Lockwood is somebody that tends to get overlooked. Uh, but I'll, I'll make one. Trent knows this, and that is that if you go to the uh, uh, cemetery near in uh, Bruno, near San Francisco, where Nimitz is buried, there are six graves in that separate plot. Um, they are uh, three officers and their wives. And they are Nimitz, Jones, and Charlie Lockwood, who all agreed they wanted to spend eternity together. So they got along well. Who else have we not talked about? Anybody? Tom? Well, we, we briefly mentioned uh, Bruins. Yeah. Um, we mentioned him, mistake he made and that he's dead. I'd like to say something about <laughs> him. <positive. laughs> um, There's more to the story. <laughs> There's more to the story. <laughs> All right. No, I think, I think that um, Spruance deserves a great deal of credit. I, yeah. he's, he's a personal hero of mine, and it's always I'm, – I'm not alone in the fact that Halsey gets five stars and Spruance does it, and that, that thing will go on forever <sighs> and then so forth. Yeah. But, uh, but I think that, you know, th this, this was a man who was, again, a very different kind of leader from the ones we've been talking about. And, and exhibited the kind of skills that we needed at the right times and so yep. forth. Um, I personally think that, that he was absolutely justified in the way he handled Philippine Sea, despite the criticism that went around in the wardrooms and the ready rooms in, in the fleet, because his mission was to guard that thing. And remember that the Japanese, all through the war, had these elaborate plans where you're looking this way and they're coming in that way. They're trying to do all these different things. And there's always that fear that if he'd gone charging after the, the Japanese, that some other force might come in and, and disrupt that landing. So I, I think it's perfectly justifiable. But these debates go on forever, and they always will, and that's kind of what is good. Which brings me one more quick interesting point, I think. Sitting here in this discussion, we've got two people on this, this panel here who have both written books about the same person. And, <laughs> and, well, but, but this is but I think this is, yeah. this is good <laughs> because they're working from the same basic material, obviously, and yet their books are very, very different. And I think that that says a lot about the historical process that, that we have and the fact that, that if, if it didn't work that way, there'd be a lot fewer uh, history books than there are now, which some people would argue would be a good thing, but I'm not sure. But, <laughs> but, but there's always that opportunity to take that same material and look at it differently and come up with these things, which these two gentlemen have done. So I think that that's, that's an important element and one of the reasons why we're sitting here doing this, I think. Tom Buell wrote the classic biography of Spruance called The Quiet Warrior. And he said he talked to Spruance's flag lieutenant after Spruance took over the task force from Halsey, who had skin problems. And Miles Browning was the chief of staff and overrated, erratic, and what have you. But Spruance is the one who launched the attack at the right time to catch the Japanese carriers. And that was a real turning point, uh, moving from the offensive or moving into the offensive phase, which was followed up at Guadalcanal, more of the offensive. And he had to overrule Browning. Yes. And, and Browning was the senior aviator on board, so that was that took, that took something. So I see nobody lining up at the microphones here. I'm looking back in the room back there to see if we have any online questions that have come in. Here come some folks. Good, thank you. Um, nothing's appearing on my screen here, so I'm going to say that you probably get the first question. Please go ahead. <laughs> Hello, my name is Brian Perry, and I have two questions. One, uh, with regards to Halsey and his leadership, when you look at his staff, you've mentioned Miles Browning, his chief of staff, um, current scholarship seems to be that Mitcher essentially cost the U.S. a carrier by going off on his own at Midway, and... You know, there's arguments been made that he would never have done that if Halsey had been present. You know, and then the incidents you've talked about at Leyte Gulf. And the question, does Halsey even know Azal is a decoy? Does his staff have reason to believe he's a decoy and not a threat, or is it just an opportunity to sink ships? So what does that tell us about Halsey's leadership, the state of his staff? And my second question is, 
you know, should Frank Jack Fletcher be in the discussion? You know, it, certainly post-World War II, his reputation suffered very badly, but I think current scholarship <clears throat> points to the fact that he was actually a very skilled commander. So I'm curious to think what you hear, hear what you gentlemen think about Frank Jack Those Fletcher. Those are both excellent questions. Who wants to go first? Well, uh, I'll Frank. initiate with uh, a discussion of Mitcher's decision and that a uh, flight to nowhere is that what uh, you would have called it, I think. <laughs> uh, the seeds for that are planted in, in the uh, op boards uh, that come out of uh, Nimitz's headquarters, right? There is an assumption that perhaps the Japanese will operate their carriers in two groups. And uh, given what happens with Mitcher, right? I mean, he doesn't get cashiered or anything. He has a continued opportunity. He's placed in uh, command of uh, uh, a carrier task force not, not soon thereafter, and then goes on to, to command the, uh, the Air Forces in the Solomons. Uh, so it seems to me that there is some willingness to accept this idea that it's okay to try to knock out all the Japanese carriers in one blow if they are in two groups, which is what he's gunning for. Right? Uh, which makes me wonder, would Halsey have prevented that from happening? Or was Halsey in on this idea? Probably not. Well, a couple of but, things here. <laughs> I, I, I have to think of this. Well, I'm, sorry. I'm the guy who probably more than anyone else was responsible for the flight to nowhere explanation that... Uh, Mitcher was deliberately seeking out what he believed to be a second group of two carriers. The intelligence reports early on had only reported two Japanese carriers. They were all four cooperating together. We know that now. They did not know that at the time. Uh, Mitcher was an aggressive officer, as Ernest Evans was an aggressive officer, as Willis Lee was an aggressive officer. He felt it was his duty to find those other two carriers and go get them. He's the senior aviator at Point Luck that day. He's aviator number 33. Neither Fletcher nor Spruance wore gold wings. It did. He felt, this is my responsibility. Off he went. They weren't there. Oops, never mind. The difficult part of this is that in order to disguise that and not to undercut this miraculous, near miraculous victory that the Americans have won at Midway, he submits a false report. Nimitz knows he submitted a false report because Spruance tells him Spruance was there. Now, neither Spruance nor uh, Nimitz decided to report this as a falsified report. And the reason I suspect, and I want to hear what Trent thinks about this, is because he didn't want to wash the Navy's dirty linen in public. We won this thing. We don't need to go around cutting off heads and or cutting the legs out from somebody. He remembered when he was a midshipman in that big fight about the Samson Schley controversy from the Spanish American War and put the, gave the Navy a black eye. That's not going to happen on my watch. So he kept quiet. Now, Mitchell, of course, does subsequently become not only a task force commander, but the senior commander of all Navy carriers in the Pacific. But he is shelved for almost a full year. He had already been announced as the commander of the Hornet task group. That was taken away from him, and he was sent to command the PBY squadron at Kaneohe. That's not exactly a step up. <laughs> so I suspect that Nimitz knew this, that he was, he was saying to Mitcher, we know you did this. I'm watching you. I'm not throwing you under the bus. Maybe you'll have a chance to come back, which, of course, he did. Um, so that, that's the way I would respond to that particular I, circumstance. I, I agree. I think that's an excellent interpretation of most likely what happened, given what we know about uh, e e Nimitz, he tries to find roles for people to fit in, that align to their yeah, capabilities. Yeah, absolutely. Position. He's a people Right, manager. so it's, it, it, and, <laughs> and uh, Mitchell is being aggressive. He is aired by being too aggressive, in a way. Ah, uh, okay. We can, we can work with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that's what Nimitz thinks to himself, or maybe even says to him, quite frankly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you've got to sort of cool your jets here for a little bit. I want to keep an eye on you. Yeah. Uh, and then, yeah, sends into the Solomon. Right. Serves very well. Now, the other half of that question was, was Frank Jack Fletcher. Who's going right. to jump in on Frank Jack? Tom? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> I want to jump in on Oh, you, you want to talk about that? Uh, well, no, the part of the question was, was about Halsey um, ah. uh, going off to the north. And I think, in fairness, I don't think that Halsey's error was going – after the decoys. He didn't know they were decoys. 
that at this point in the war, we did not fully un- appreciate how decimated the Japanese were, and that the, the fact that there were carriers to the north was a valid target for him to go after. The fault is that he took everything with him when he had this gigantic, bigger than anything in history, uh, uh, fleet. Even a picket he, destroyer. Right. I mean, Earth. exactly. He, could, he took the entire thing with him, and that... That is uh, well. Mahan the said it, fleet concentration. That's the secret to success. Well, that's the other thing. I mean, and you know, Halsey went to the War College and he read Mahan and so forth. And I read his paper that he wrote there, and I still don't know what it was about. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but. well, here's the other thing about Halsey and, and the decoy. He would not admit till the day he died, even on the day he died, that it was a decoy. He would never accept that because if, if it was a decoy, he was duped, yep. and he wouldn't accept that he right. was duped. Yeah. So he never acknowledged that it was a decoy. Do we want to say anything about Frank Jack Fletcher before we move on? Well, I think John Lundstrom's right about this, by the way, on Fletcher. So, Paul. Well, Lee, according to his aide, perceived that it was a decoy, and that's why he kept sending the, these messages to yeah. Halsey's flagship. <laughs> and, and John Lundstrom has done marvelous work about Fletcher. He, he, he got a bad rap because it seemed like he was always – fueling when he should have been more aggressive. but uh, Is that King's fault or Fletcher's fault? I mean, King is the guy who never trusts Fletcher. He thinks he cut <clears> it off too soon in the, in the Coral Sea. He thinks he was, as you say, always off fueling. He shouldn't have been fueling the Guadalcanal and had only two carriers instead of three when the Japanese struck. Not that it would have made any difference. But is that because King just had a thing about Frank Jack or was Frank Jack cautious? Some of both, but King okay. certainly had a thing for him because he sent him to the North Pacific and got yes, him out did. of the combat yes, he did. for the most part. Yeah. Yes, he did. Anyway, he's always called Frank Jack because his uncle was Frank Friday Fletcher, after whom the Fletcher class destroyers were named. And sure. so they always used both names because otherwise it would people would get confused. Yes, sir. You're accepting questions from an old soldier. Um, my name is Martin Irons, I'm a former medical service officer. Um, so a question about Halsey, and actually going right back to the Battle of Lady Gulf. So he's 62 years old. He's, Not uh, that that's old, by the way. I'm just... Well, <laughs> well, that's clearly understood. <laughs> but, it, you know, it, it's a measurement. He's 62 years old. He's recovering from a virus, some said the flu. He's had very little sleep in the course of the last three days. He's living on nicotine and caffeine. And at that point, um, in the he has had extracted 14 of his 32 teeth. He's had acceleration of dental loss during uh, the war. So the, the medical mind says on the calendar he's 62. Physically, metabolically, he's much older. So had they woken him up, had that message from uh, Admiral Lee or Mitchell actually had gotten past um, Carney and they've woken Halsey up. Would he have been physically okay. in a position? Yeah, that's to great. No, that's we get the idea of the question. Anybody want to take this on? I'd say it's anybody's guess. We'll never know. But Halsey, on a couple of other occasions, walked into things that he shouldn't have. Those were the, the typhoons in December and the following spring. Yep. He should have been better advised to pay attention to his weatherman. Uh, so. But this goes back to the broader staff, too. The, the circumstances you raised earlier, which were quite interesting about his being asleep, supposedly because of these physical ailments, because of his teeth pain and other things, he had been, he was, the doctor was administering uh, what often gets administered late at night uh, to people who are in, having difficulty sleeping, a draught of uh, Jack Daniels. Medicinal alcohol. Medicinal alcohol. <laughs> and that uh, they were reluctant to wake him up Precisely because he had some physical ailments that they perceived as diminishing his capability for command. They were taking care of him. It's a staff officer's job to take care of your body. And they perceived taking care of him. Let the man sleep. We now are looking at him and saying, well, how dare he sleep through this crisis moment? But Well, there's preparation of the staff that goes on, too, to you know, take care of the boss, but not just take care of the boss physically, take care of these decisions. Like, so we mentioned... MacArthur, and I think you yeah. said he was surrounded by, by sycophants, <clears throat> right? But uh, Sutherland, his chief of staff, knows well enough that when the proposal 
initially sort of from Halsey up through Nimitz and then from Nimitz to the Joint Chiefs of Staff, hey, let's bypass all these intermediate objectives in advance to Litty in October rather than December of 1944. Sutherland knows well enough, well, I can't communicate with MacArthur because he's at sea observing radio silence, but I better say yes to this because if I don't, yeah. the boss knows, is going to be yeah. upset. No, that's true. Tom, you and, yeah, so, I, well, I, I just want oh, to say sorry. Halsey has it teed up mm -hmm. in a sense, not by his staff, but uh, Gerald Bogan, who is commanding, mm -hmm. if I remember right, uh, task group 38.3, has a plan. My task group, mm -hmm. task force 34, we'll hang out here. The rest of the third fleet goes north, right. and we can fight them in both spots. It's, it's there. So all the staff has to do is say, yeah, yeah, we'll do that. You know, just sort of check the box. They don't have to formulate a new set of plans and orders. It's been teed up. And he was rejected. Yes. Yeah. One of the things we've got to keep in mind here, these are human beings, and, and they have human characteristics and so forth. And, you know, as historians, one of the things that really struck me when I was writing my first book, I'm sitting there judging these people, these admirals and so forth. I'm sitting there with drinking coffee and, and, and you know, <laughs> my computer's erasing my errors and all this sort of stuff, and I'm telling them what they should have done or something like that. And that's a tough situation when you think about it. Yeah, but, being a historian is but, great. But, but, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. But, but, you know, I mean, look at Corita, for example, at Leyte Gulf. I mean, this guy, uh, by the time he gets to this big battle, you know, the big question is, why did he turn away and so forth? Well, this guy has been, he'd gone for a midnight swim. His ship has sunk out from under him um, two days before. He's gone through San Bernardino Strait in the, middle, in the dark of night. He's done all these, these things, and, and, and uh, he's got to be absolutely exhausted and so forth. The question is, does that excuse it? Well, we can't. I mean, he's still the man in command, and we have to go with what we got. So whether he's missing 14 teeth or didn't get enough sleep or whatever, or it still comes in. Or si <laughs> Anyway. Okay. So, so the, uh, the, the part two, and real quick, is so Court of Inquiry passed Lady, Court of Inquiry passed the Typhoon. He's in the China Sea on January 10th when the word finally is released about the loss of the three destroyers and 800 sailors. Had that come out at the time and it lost King's favor, who would King and Nimitz have replaced Halsey with? Wow. Well, first of all, uh, the courts did not find him innocent. They found him guilty, and uh, the verdict was overturned by higher command of King and Nimitz decided that it would impact uh, morale at home if this hero of, and of course Halsey became a hero early on because of those raids that Trent mentioned in January, February of 1942, when we were really in the dumps. And here's some good news. <coughs> Halsey did that for America. And so now to say, no, you're being relieved for cause, you're out. They wanted to dismiss him from the Navy. And that was overturned. So the high command was not going to let that happen, is the short answer and the cop-out answer to your question. Um, but I, who, 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 if not Halsey, who? I guess Bruins stays on the job. And I, I think it's worth noting, too, that the, the higher command was concerned about the influence on Japanese perception. As oh, yeah. Well. It would give them right. a PR victory. Right, right, absolutely it would. True. Yes, I yes. can barely see you through the lights. Sorry about that. Lieutenant J.G. Dave Brandt, 1963. Uh, my question is, you've, is Roosevelt relieved the Admiral and General of Pearl Harbor, but he never relieved MacArthur, who, in my opinion, was much more negligent in the Philippines three days later. Why? <laughs> well, my take is that the, for political reasons, he wanted to imply that all the dereliction of duty and so forth was in Hawaii, even there were so many people in Washington who also failed to foresee what was going to happen. And MacArthur had a popularity, and uh, that probably would not have gone down well with the public, nor would it have fit in with his strategy that all the problem was in Hawaii. It brings us back to that personality factor. I mean, MacArthur is something unique. And he has this tremendous uh, effect on people. They either hate him or they love him, and there are very few in, in between. But many, many people think that MacArthur should be running the entire world, 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 world you know, the entire war. Um, and you've got to understand that people are 
naming their children after the Indian, chief, Indian tribes are making him chief. I mean, this guy, he's bigger than life. I, I think that's probably the simplest way to put it. And that's what Roosevelt's up against. And he has to figure out what to do. If he makes him in charge of the entire war, he's going to lose half of his constituency. If he dismisses him or buries him somewhere, he's going to lose the other half. So he finds a compromise. And that's really why we have two completely different fronts working simultaneously in the Pacific, which says a lot about America. We're even capable <coughs> of doing that. But, but the fact that this, this comes about this way, which, which mostly turns out to be a good thing, keeps the Japanese off balance because they're constantly responding to the two different things, runs into some trouble at Leyte Gulf when they finally come together and they don't have a common chain. Anyway, that's a quick summary. But We all remember not too many years ago when there was an economic crisis in this country and the phrase that was being thrown about is why some uh, were suffering and others not. And the phrase was, too big to fail. Remember that? <laughs> The yeah. banks were too big to fail, the car right. dealership, and so That's on. Right. Uh, and MacArthur was too big yeah, to fail. Definitely. It, it, it would have been such a blow. He was such a national hero, more so than Halsey, uh, when Halsey encountered the typhoons and had to be saved because of his public reputation. I think you're absolutely right. I was just going to... Hi, um, my name is Heather Haley. I'm a historian with the Naval History and Heritage Command, um, and I will admit before um, I ask my question that I'm a polywog getting into World War II history, so I'm, uh, um, anyway. Uh, so you, you spoke earlier, and I squirmed a little bit when you were speaking about um, radar, because that is my interest in 1942, is the um, uh, introduction of uh, SG radar uh, the early battles of Guadalcanal. Um, and I was hoping, um, I've spoke to Trent at length about this, so I'm actually going to um, hopefully open it up to both um, Paul and Tom, to, and perhaps to some degree Craig, um, to get your opinions on, You had, I think you had mentioned earlier, Craig, uh, that there were some uh, who were uh, reticent to use, to use radar. Um, so is it, so the question that I, I posed Trent a couple weeks ago uh, is is this a, a, a an older generation, um, just you young whippersnappers with your radar? Um, I'm or, sitting right here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, I just would really uh, uh, appreciate your your input on yeah, at least in 1942 the introduction of radar. Generally, what was the what was the consensus? Well, Trent, you're the you're the guy. Yes, but well, she's but already I, talked to me. I've, oh. I've, I've uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I do think you're absolutely on to something there. And, and the example I would use, and I invite people to, to discuss this, particularly Paul, I suppose, is that Dan Callahan, I think, um, in the early stages of the Naval Battle of Guadalcanal, uh, in the middle of the night, in a rainstorm, the Helena had uh, SG radar and was reporting to him the range and bearing. And he just either wasn't sure he wanted to trust that or he wanted to, didn't want to show his hand too early. I'm not sure what was going on there. But one of the things about radar during World War II is that it was, uh, it was like a Rube Goldberg trick in 1940. And by 1945, it was really sophisticated, gave you range, bearing, even altitude, things that were not possible in 1930 and 1940. When the California had a radar set put on, somebody said, well, it's like a bed spring sitting on the mast, and it's unreliable, and it's only good out to 60 miles, and it doesn't give altitude, and... But because radar improved so dramatically during the war, uh, there were sort of stages of how much do I trust this thing? Am I on to this? Yeah, I think you are on to okay. something. Although I would criticize your assessment of Callahan because yeah, when, when, good, he, I want to hear that. when he receives bearings from yeah. from Helena, he changes course to intercept the Japanese formation, hmm. to put his plan into action. So okay. he acts on the information. We could argue he doesn't act on it quickly enough. Well, he didn't fire any torpedoes. I mean, that's the thing. <laughs> what you do is you fire the torpedoes when you know where the enemy is before you open with your gunfire. Fire initiated that oh, conflict. Yeah, but that, that was at least from what we can reconstruct. Yeah. I, would, I would suggest okay. that was anyway, plan. But anyway, I, yeah. Poor Callahan dies in this. I don't want to pick on a man who <clears throat> died heroically and would posthumously receive the Medal of Honor. So I'll take it back. Well, I yeah. just want to say I've, I've known Heather since before she earned her Ph.D., and congratulations on that. I want to bring in the concept of the Combat Information Center, and Lee yeah. was a real pioneer in that. Yeah. They took what had been the flag sea cabin and turned it into a 
what was in effect a primitive CIC. They had a radar repeater in there. There was not a radar repeater on the bridge, so Lee had to rely on phone talkers to get the information that was coming in from radar. And ironically, this man who was blind without glasses, when the first salvo went out from the Washington, the blast knocked his glasses to the deck, and he was literally blind at that point. He and his aide were reaching around so he could get him and see what happened. And I, I want to have one more discussion about Halsey's and Typhoons. My favorite work of fiction is The Cane Mutiny by Herman Woke, and that typhoon is the centerpiece of that drama and Captain Quig just breaking up on the bridge. He lost control. And Lieutenant Merrick, the XO, is trying to maintain some sanity in the midst of chaos. And the helmsman is a man with a name very similar to mine named Stilwell. And Quig <laughs> says, get that idiot off the wheel. And Merrick very calmly says, but Stilwell's our best man. <laughs> oh, you wow. told that whole story. <laughs> with that, and speaking of ending, this is going to be our last question. Well, so thank you. Uh, Robbie Harris, a former naval person. First, I want to congratulate the Naval Institute and this outstanding panel. It just went really well done. I, I guess I'm trying to understand the, the leadership skills, the war fighting skills that these leaders possess that you talked about this afternoon. It's my understanding that during the interwar years that there was an annual fleet battle problem and that the Navy did not deploy the way it does today and possibly wearing itself out the way it is today. <laughs> but yet, when the war happened, there was a leadership skill there. There were the war fighting skills there. How did that happen with the fact that they had only one fleet battle problem a year? Well, uh a good question, Robbie. I think the, the key is to think about it. I mean, the way that you phrased it, fleet battle problem, uh, that makes it sound much smaller than I think these actually were. These are, these are large operational exercises. Uh, I forget exactly which one it is, but there's one in the Pacific in the 30s that essentially spans from Hawaii north to the Aleutian. Right? So you're covering a vast area here. And, and so it's not just you know, a battle. It's not a tactical engagement. It's how do we, most of these are geared toward, how do we uh, approach these operational problems that we will encounter in war in the Pacific against the Empire of Japan? They're exploring that, and they're exploring that over a, a series of days, sometimes even into, into weeks, and some of these are tied together. So you might have spin-off tactical exercises uh, that, that feed into or, or emerge out of, out of the fleet problem itself. Uh, I think it's more appropriate to think about it as an annual training regiment and learning mechanism, right? New recruits come into the Navy, they become acclimated, uh, familiarized with their ships, and then those ships begin to practice together in formations, squadrons, and then all on up through the year to culminate in this large exercise that examines an operational, an operational problem. And one of the key aspects of it also is that it's tied into thinking uh, within OPNAV, uh, the Office of the Chief of Naval Operations, which is thinking about what shape a war will take. What should the war plan be? And what are the challenges in this war plan? And then also the Naval War College, which is tangentially involved, but looking more at the future. What is a future naval battle five years out going to look like? What will airplanes <clears throat> be like? What kind of ships can we expect with the current um, construction that is underway to have in the fleet? And that informs then this exercise so that sometimes they will have constructive units, virtual ships, essentially, mm -hmm. uh, that allow the Navy to explore what it might be like to fight, not today, but five or, or, or more years from now. Uh, and all of this loops together. So not only are they learning about what it would be like to fight, uh, fight the fleet of the future, uh, but they're also exercising officers across the fleet in terms of how, how to behave. They're conditioning them in a way. This aggressive, aggressiveness you asked about Evans, you see that kind of aggressiveness in d destroyer officers <laughs> throughout the Pacific conflict. Uh, Evans is perhaps a, you know, a, an exemplary example, but he's not unique in, right. that, in, 
that sense. I'm not going to disagree with any of that. I think you're absolutely right. But I want to add one more thought, and that is that remember that at Midway in June of 1942, Nimitz had a hard time scraping together what we'll call two and a half carriers to fight the Battle of Midway. But by 1945, the United States has on its roster 100 <laughs> aircraft carriers. Who manned those aircraft carriers? They weren't academy graduates. They weren't people who'd been through training exercises, however elaborate they may have been. They were the soda jerks and truck drivers and college students and farmers who came to the flag when the need was there, who manned that fleet like those on the king. Um, and, and allow the United States not only to survive that war, but to triumph in that war. And I've heard people say, we couldn't do that today. I don't believe them. I think we could. Admiral Bailey, back to you. Well, thank you. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Craig Simons, Trent Hone, Paul Stilwell, and Tom Cutler for a superb discussion. I think we could continue this, questions or no questions, we could continue this discussion for another hour. But I want to thank them, and let's give them a big hand. And yes, my father was uh, Lieutenant J.G. Joseph T. Daly, Jr., USNR, who fought in the Atlantic and the Pacific. And uh, you're right, 90% USNR. Uh, I'm pleased to present each of our guests. Uh, commanding the Pacific Marine Corps generals in World War II, perhaps that's a future session, Whoa. by Stephen Taith, a Naval Institute Press book. And I want to thank our guests again. This is just a token of our appreciation. And before we conclude, I'd like to tell the audience that our authors will be available out in the foyer uh, in the atrium area with, uh, with their books and uh, available to do signings and discussion. So hope you take advantage of that. And again, let's give them one more big hand. Thank you. After you? <laughs> Age before. Thank you. Yeah. All the way. All the way from the way. Yes. Good. Thank you. <laughs>